Welcome to part one of the Firebox Throwdown. Now in this series of two videos, we are going to test Firebox products against our favorites in the category. So let's see who's up first. In this corner, the 10 and a half inch Banks Frybake Expedition Fry Pan. This baby has traveled with us to a lot of places and never let us down. She's tough as nails, comes straight from Hudson, New York. This all American pan is ready to rumble. And in this corner, we have got the pride of mainland China, the Firebox 10 inch skillet. Now this is a little softer on the sides here, but we're gonna see if it can take a beating from the champ. So let's get this baby ready to go. First up is the weigh-in. Now in this lightweight category, weight is important. So let's put these contenders on the scale, see where they clock in. First off, the fry bake. Coming in at one pound, two ounces and five eighths, this is no featherweight, but it's still a lightweight. Next up, Firebox jumps on the scales. Oh, and 15 ounces takes the cake. You can tell these two are gonna go head to head. The boss, no, you're the boss. I'll cook better than you. No, I'll cook better than you. Now the fry bake, when it shows up to your door, all you need to do is give it a scrub in soap and water and it's ready to jump in the ring. Now it might show up like this or it might come with its fancy lid. That lid is designed to allow you to bake and put coals on top and not fall off. In fact, you can even burn a fire on top of that. That's all up to you whether you want that lid or not. Firebox shows up a little bit differently. It comes requiring a little bit more maintenance. You still have to scrub this pan, but it's got some kind of coating on it from the factory. So the first thing you need to do before this thing gets in the ring, you need to toss it into a 500 degree oven and you need to clean that coating off. Since we've never used this pan before, we're gonna go ahead and start that process by plunging this thing into some soapy water. We're just gonna give it a nice scrub. We're not gonna use anything abrasive, but anodized aluminum is supposed to be 30% stronger than any sort of stainless steel, so I think you should be able to. But we're not going to. We're just gonna go ahead and give this a scrubbing, rinse it off, and get the oven heated up. Welcome back to this exciting first round of the throwdown. Now I will say that Firebox did file a petition. They say that you must season their pan three times in a hot oven before use. I passed that on to the judges. Judges said that for this first round, it's an anodized pan. We're gonna let it go naked because no other anodized pan has ever asked us to do that. All right, welcome to the first challenge of the throwdown. In this challenge, we're using the Firebox Gen 2 folding stove and the Trongia gas burner. We want a small burner because we want to pinpoint heat on these stoves to see how hot the center gets and how they distribute heat. We also want to see how hot they get because thickness of aluminum does make a difference. So first up, we're gonna put the Firebox 10 inch on this stove and we're gonna leave it for three minutes, checking the temperature every one minute to see how hot it gets and how it distributes heat. Time to test the young upstart. Center of the pan, we're registering 251 degrees. As we move around to the edges, we drop to 152, 141, 160, and 224. Three minute mark, and let's see how this thing clears out. We are at 358 degrees. As we move around the pan, we've got 280, 282, 260, and 303. So a pretty good showing for the pan. We've not touched the stove, so we've got absolutely the same heat level. On goes the champion. One thing to remember, the Banks Fry Bake has a much larger cooking area. So we will be trying to distribute that heat over a larger area. All right, at the end of one minute, the fry bake comes in at 237 degrees. On the edges, 165, 132, 150, and 178. And the final readings for the champ, center of the stove is now at 280, 290 degrees. Around the edges we go, 223, 191, 203, and 245. 
So that's the end of our first test. Let's tabulate the scores and see how we came out. It is time for the second challenge. The results of the first challenge are in. Now both of these pans did a pretty decent job of distributing the heat around the edges. The firebox did a little bit better, but don't forget that it had less space to have to cover. So at 72% ratio between the coldest and the hottest on the firebox and 65% on the fry bake, I'm calling that even. And what I will say though, is the temperature difference in the center of those pans. The firebox was at 358 and the fry bake at 290 shows me that either the fry bake is a thicker aluminum or it's a denser aluminum because it didn't heat up as quickly. Now you may find a slower heat to be a disadvantage or an advantage. I think maybe we'll see where that difference comes in later, but right now we have a tie. The next test involves a propane camp stove and some sacrificial sweet potatoes. Now these babies were beyond their prime, so they won't mind us throwing them into a hot skillet. What we're looking for here is the ability to fry a potato as well as non-stickiness. So if we can fry these potatoes and get minimal sticking, that's a win for me. So let's see how they come out. One final swirl of the oil, and the fry bake is up first. In go the sweet potatoes. Let's just see how it goes. After just a couple of minutes, we've got some nice caramelization coming from the fry bake and absolutely zero sticking. I think this is a great performance, but not unexpected. The fry bake has done its job. This is a notoriously hot stove, so I'm gonna be curious how the firebox does. As you can see, some of the bits got a little dark. Now, normally this is not how I fry sweet potatoes. I use a heavier pan, a cast iron skillet or a carbon steel skillet with lower heat and more time, but camp stoves sometimes are not able to accomplish that. So I'm calling the fry bake done, zero sticking. Let's get the firebox on. We've just put the firebox on to warm up a little bit. It does have the advantage of having the fire turned down a bit from the fry bake, as we did have to turn it down a bit while we were cooking the potatoes. So we're gonna let this warm up for a minute or two and then we're gonna throw these potatoes on and see how this performs. And I'm really curious to see how it performs with having had no seasoning. The oil in the firebox has now started to ripple, so we're gonna go ahead and put the potatoes in. Seems a bit hotter already. All right, let's see how this cooks. All right, we're gonna call test number two done. We've got the same sort of caramelization, lacking that you have. The potatoes are sliding around in the skillet pretty well, not quite as well as they did in the fry bake. And we seem to have more oil left in this pan, but the uh, potatoes are sliding around and uh, they got the same caramelization. So I'm gonna call this one pretty close to a tie as well. So after the end of two rounds, these two competitors are putting up a great fight. I think we're starting to get a little bit of an opinion of the two, but before we get going on to the third round, let me talk about what we learned a bit after the end of the second round. First off, the Banks Fry Bake. If you noticed, when we put oil in it for the potato cook, the oil moved to the edges of the pan. And the reason that did that is because it had developed a bit of convexity in the middle of the pan, which means it warped a little bit. So we did contact their corner and ask them what was going on. They pointed us to their website. The website said in their frequently asked questions that this can happen with heat and the solution is to put it on the ground and step on it to flatten it back out. This baby can take a beating. So we did that. However, on the firebox, we had just exactly the opposite situation happen. Instead of a convexity, this pan is developing a concavity into the middle of the pan. And what that means is that things are going to start flowing to the center. So let me show you what this does. So to show you the impact of this, if you look at the Banks Fry Bake after we stepped on it, the concavity is gone to a bit and it doesn't spin at all. There's no movement to it. Conversely, the firebox when we give it a little spin, it spins and it spins. It is like a top. So we definitely have a raised center in this pan, which means that we're getting some warping. When we first got the pan, it did this slightly. It's gotten worse after the first two rounds. The other thing that you may notice is in this test and all subsequent tests, this pan remains unseasoned. The judges have decided that given the performance of this pan in the first two rounds, 
that we are going to continue to use this as an anodized pan without seasoning. At the end, the judges will tell you why they made that decision, but for the moment, this remains unseasoned. So let's get to the cooking test. For round three, it is the sear test. For this test, we're gonna use the iCamper Disco. We've got two third pound hamburger patties that we're gonna sear in the pans. So the methodology here is we're gonna put one pan on, we're gonna heat it up to 350, slap the burger on, let that go for three minutes, flip it and see how it did in the searing. And what that's going to test is the pan's ability to capture and maintain heat, put on a good sear, and then recover that heat once the cold meat is put on to see how well we can get the sear going. So what we're gonna do is we're just gonna spray first the firebox. We're gonna shoot it with some Pam. Just to make sure it's not dry, we're gonna get it on the fire. We're gonna start watching to see when this thing gets to 350. Once it does, on goes the first burger. All right, the firebox has hit 350. Let's go ahead and get the first burger on. And again, we're gonna time this for three minutes and see what it looks like. All right, that is the end of the three minutes. Let's see how we did. And this patty tended to wanna to rise up in the middle, so I did do some pressing. And I think that is a good looking sear. No complaints there at all. As I said, the middle was rising up, so I pressed it down a bit, but around the edges, we got a nice sear. So we're gonna go ahead and finish this burger, then we're gonna start the next. First burger is done. We're gonna go ahead and take it off. I wanna see if the firebox maintained the nonstick capability. And yes, it's releasing pretty good. We've got some burn chart on bits. I'm gonna see how easy that is to clean off, but off goes this burger. Got some nice sear. In fact, we got a little char on that side. So we're gonna take this off and the fry bake goes on. Bringing this up to 350 and then on goes the burger. Fry bake has hit 350, so we're gonna do the same thing. On goes the burger. As before, did take a little more time to come up to 350, being, I think, a slightly thicker aluminum. It did take a bit more time, as well as having a much bigger cooking surface so the, fire, the heat does disperse more around the edges. All right, three minutes is up. Let's see what the fry bake did. Super easy release. Very nice browning. I think very similar, maybe slightly better, but I don't think materially. So let's finish cooking this burger and see how the pan looks when it's done. And the fry bake burger is done as well. Let's see how this flips. No sticking at all. Little, uh, Charring and browning, very similar, maybe not as much as we got from the firebox, which I chalk up to a heavier pan. So the fire is not getting as hot in the center. The crumbs are scraping up nicely. So let's let this rest and I'll show you the residue that we got in both pans. All right, let's take a look at the burgers side by side. And this is the second side where they finish cooking. On this side, we have the firebox and on this side, the fry bake. And again, the fry bake is not nearly as crispy. Uh, it's not nearly as charred. The fire didn't change. We had the exact same setting, the same amount of time, but it looks to me that the firebox is just getting hotter. It's a thinner aluminum. It's heating up faster. It's a smaller surface. So it's just charring the food a bit more. And let me show you how the pans look after the cook. So if you can come over here. There is residue in both of the pans. Now, if we take the fry bake, which says go ahead and use metal utensils in this, most of it scrapes away relatively easily. And we have the same thing in the firebox. However, it looks like the firebox has got a coating of stuff that's gonna need a bit more scrubbing. So again, I don't know if that's because this firebox is a bit more porous. If the anodizing is not as hard, it definitely looks like different type of anodizing and there are multiple types. Some are harder than others. So let's get these cleaned up. We've got one more test, but at this point, it looks like the firebox did get a bit more staining. So we're gonna check that out as well. Okay, for this fourth and final round, 
these pans are gonna face one of the most torturous tests any pan can face. That is a scrambled egg. We've got our disco on low, low heat. We don't want these pans to get too hot. We're gonna start with the champ and we're gonna use Pam cooking spray. We're gonna spray the Pam, sorry. We're gonna spray the pan with Pam. We're gonna put it on the burner for one minute. Then we're gonna cook the egg. And we're gonna see if we get any sticking. First up, we have got one minute on the uh, Banks Fry Bake. So here we go. Egg goes in. As you can tell our cooker is not exactly even. So let's just cook this egg and see what happens. So far, there's not a stick anywhere on this pan. All right, I think these scrambled eggs are done, particularly if you are one that likes it a bit on the soft side. And as you can see, we got no sticking at all in the fry bake. So let's take this off and get the firebox on the fire to see how it performs. All right, for the contender, let's give it some oil, get it on for one minute. I do think this pan being a bit thinner is going to heat up faster. We'll see if that makes a difference. Our minute, in goes the egg. And as I guessed, it looks like it's just a touch hotter, but not overly. Let's see how this scrambles up. And if you like the shape of this pan, this type of skillet makes it easier to get into the corners and scrape things out of it. So again, it's kind of the difference between a traditional cast iron skillet shape and a carbon steel shape. And this definitely is warmer than the Banks Fry Bake. This egg is cooking much faster, but we are getting, again, no sticking at all. And a reminder, we have not seasoned this pan. Firebox recommends seasoning this pan before you cook in it. We have not done that. We have a method to our madness. All right, that egg is done and no sticking. So we have a decision from the judges. And I've got to tell you, this was extremely close. Both of these contenders cooked well. Both of these contenders cleaned up well. And the firebox surprised me particularly because we did not season this pan. And I'm going to explain to you when I talk about the firebox why that decision was made. But first off, we do have a decision from the judges. And that decision is the Banks Fry Bake, former champ, and still the champ. It was very close, but the deciding factors for the Fry Bake were the slightly thicker aluminum, which allowed the heat to not penetrate the pan so quickly. It allowed you to control the heat better. I think it controlled warping better. And the shape of the pan, although we didn't bake in these pans, the shape of the pan makes us more multi-purpose because it allows you to do more traditional baking. Also, the capacity to get a bespoke lid for this pan that doesn't flop off when you shake it, not that you're shaking it, but it, it stays solid and it's built with indentations around the edges so that you can build a fire on this and you can use this as a Dutch oven just makes this an all-around multi-purpose cooker for the backcountry. Now, the downside to the Champ, being a little thicker and being made in America, this pan, as it sits, rings the bell at $84. If you want to add the lid, that brings the price of the combo up to $113. And if you want the bespoke pot grippers, add another $18. So all in, we're talking about, what is that? That is $131. Now I like the pot grippers, but to be honest with you, I prefer a traditional pot gripper to the pliers. And the reason is when you're lifting the pan and pouring, these things can sometimes let the pan slip. But these are designed to be able to grab the pan at the right angle, to grab the lid at the right angle, and if you have a wire in here, you've got a hook to lift the lid off using the wire. So this is a complete system designed to cook. It has decades of experience under its belt, 
It's held up under extreme conditions in the National Outdoor Leadership School and just has all the credentials that one would need for a high quality lifetime backcountry cooking skillet. Having said that, I was extremely surprised by this firebox skillet. When I first got it, I looked at it and what this looks to me to be is the same pan coming from the same Asian factory that the GSI Pinnacle non-stick pans come from. It seems like it has the same design in the bottom and everything. So I wasn't sure how this would hold up, if it would be sticky because of the recommendation for seasoning, but this baby performed extremely well. Now it did have that warping issue and it did get worse after the last two tests with the hamburger and the eggs. It is a spinner. There's no doubt about that. Makes me wonder about the long-term viability of the pan. Makes me curious about how it would handle cooking over a campfire as opposed to a camp stove or a firebox stove. But all that being said, this thing performed extremely well. It didn't stick. It cleaned up well. On both pans, we used Barkeeper's Friend, which is what I take when we go camping with these. They both cleaned up really well. I saw no degradation at all in the anodizing of this pan. And the beauty of this, and this is where Firebox Stove has just knocked it out of the park with this pan. This pan coming with this long pot holder comes in at $33.95. That is an extremely good value for this quality of a pan. If you want to add a lid, it's not going to be a bespoke cooking lid like the fry bake, but they do make a what they call the cowboy plate. And if you invert that plate and set it on top of here, it acts as a lid. Now it doesn't seal around the edge, it just sits on top and you can knock it off, but it does work. I'm not sure how much heat you can put on it. If you can build a fire on it like you could with the fry bake, simply because the warping issue of the pan, I think would probably be the same with the cowboy plate, but I don't know that for sure, so I'm not going to say that. So this pan, definitely gets the value award. I don't see any places where they've chimped it, where they've done anything that says, oh yeah, here's where they, they cut corners. Other than the thickness, it is a thinner pan. It does heat up faster. I think you do run the risk of scorching things quicker. Um, the pot grippers, they work well. You can tell just by looking at them, the way things line up, the way they flex and move that they're adequate. They're not high quality. Maybe that's the wrong way to say it. They're not high precision. Um, they do have some, some sort of, you can see where they cut corners. I guess that's the best way to put it, but they work. So let me get back to the seasoning issue. Firebox recommends that you season this skillet and they recommend three seasonings at 500 degrees in your stove. When I reached out to Firebox, I asked them, why are you, why do you suggest that? Because I've never seen any anodized aluminum ever that I've owned and cooked in recommending seasoning. And they said that it didn't impact durability of the pan at all. What it did was increase the nonstick. If I am going to take a seasoned pan out into the back country and have to maintain it, which means that after every cook, I have to recoat it with oil and the seasoning is subject to scraping off, which means I have to use wooden or plastic utensils or rubber utensils. I can't scrub it very hard if something does stick. So it's a higher maintenance item. If I'm going to take something that requires that level of maintenance, I'm going to take a carbon steel or maybe even a cast iron skillet. The reason is they're better able to handle the high heat of a campfire. They become extremely non-stick. Um, I just think they cook better than aluminum. So if I'm going to do all that maintenance, I'm not going to take aluminum. Why does one take aluminum? They want to limit the weight. And if you're limiting weight, you don't want to carry a bunch of extra oil to be able to season your skillet. So that's why we didn't season it. And I think it worked great without it. If I bought this skillet, or if I was talking and recommending this skillet, I would say buy it and don't season it. Feel free to season it if you want, 
but I don't think it's necessary. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed hearing about these two skillets. They're both great choices. One is a Cadillac, one is a Chevrolet, but they both get you where you're going. If you like this content and like hearing about the camping gear that we use, please like this video and share it with your friends. And if you haven't subscribed, please take a moment to hit the sub button in the lower right-hand corner. And as always, take care and we'll see you outdoors.